Clarita here, and I've got a new sponsor, DistroKid. If you want to release your music into the world, DistroKid's the easiest way to get your music into all the major streaming platforms, unlimited uploads, and keep 100% of your royalties. And because you're a Design Freaks listener, you get 30% off. Go to distrokid.com slash VIP slash Design Freaks. DistroKid. This episode is sponsored by Isotope. Their audio software like RX helps to clean up my recordings, and they have a ton of other products on their site, isotope.com slash ruinous. Right now, Ruinous Media and Fretboard Journal listeners save 10% at checkout on any Isotope plugin or bundle using the code FRET10. So if you have a podcast or produce music, go to isotope.com slash ruinous and shop their award-winning audio production products and save 10% off your order with the code FRET10. Make your audio sound better. Welcome. Uh, welcome to episode 33 of the Design Freaks podcast, all about Six Finger Satellite, uh, featuring Rick Pelletier, uh, the drummer for Six Finger Satellite, who tells me all about the album and video concepts. Super exciting. Uh, this is the Design Freaks podcast, of course. It's a show all about record covers, graphic design, Music history. Design history. Uh, and the legends behind it all. My name's Clarita. I live in Seattle. I'm originally from Austin, Texas, which you're going to hear about in uh, some of the back in the day stuff on this episode because we do talk about the 90s. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, I want to say thank you for your support, listeners. If you like the show, please leave a review. Share it. Send me stuff. You can find photos, video links, etc. about this in every episode I've done, all 33, at designfreakspodcast.com. Uh, also, check out other killer podcasts at ruinousmedia.com. There are some great new shows, and uh, these are all music-related and Pacific Northwest-related podcasts. Um, speaking of thank yous and speaking of people from Rhode Island, <laughs> I would also like to do something I haven't done in a very long time, and that's to say thank you to John Dwyer for my theme song, for letting me use it. It's long overdue that I mention it. Um, it's a song by his project called Damaged Bug, and um, if you're wondering, the name of the song is called Jet in Jungle. Uh, Damaged Bug is one of his many projects. It's John Dwyer, of course, from the OCs. Uh, we talk about him in this episode. It, you know, the Jet and Jungle seems really appropriate for the show because uh, it's on that incredible album designed by Robert Beatty, and the record is called Cold Hot Plums. Check that out. I will probably put a link to the video on my website. Thank you. Six Finger Satellite uh, formed in 1990, and all the members went on to do other really cool stuff. Rick uh, had another project called La Machine, which is great, and... Chinese stars. So we, me and Rick chat about Rhode Island, both like the music scene then and now, and what how he's been dealing with COVID. We, we also talk about the story behind Live at the ACI. Uh, they supposedly went and performed at a correctional facility. You will hear me sound incredibly naive as I realize the real story behind it. Um, it's really funny. And then the first video I ever looked up on YouTube was Parlor Games. I mentioned that. And the reason I'm bringing it up now is because I completely forgot until after we recorded this interview that it was on Beavis and Butthead. Um, so I remembered this. And then Rick's such a good sport. I reached out to him and I was like, is there a story behind that? It, that's so funny. And so he wrote this in an email. Beavis and Butthead was a total surprise when it happened. 
I'm guessing the Sub Pop promo department was behind that, but unfortunately, I don't have many details. It blew our minds when it happened and is still pretty cool after all these years. We did get a decent check when they released it on DVD, so that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite bands. So such a treat to have Rick on the podcast and to hear these incredible stories behind these record covers. Enjoy this interview. Rick, thanks for joining me. Hello. How's it going? Hi. Going well. How are you doing? I'm doing great today. It was a fantastic uh, warm day here in uh, lovely Rhode Island. Oh, nice. Are you in um, Providence? No, I'm about a half hour outside of Providence uh, in a suburb called Tiverton. Oh, Tiverton, where you played saxophone in the high school band. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, turning into Nardwar. No, um, I did watch an interview <laughs> from 1991 today when you were, what, 19? Oh, Jesus, and I mentioned that? You did. What a horror show. Yeah, you, had, you said you had to drive 30 minutes to get to the practice space. Yes, yes, that's true. So how is um, Tiverton? Uh, it's a pretty quiet area, you know, uh, rural, uh, suburban kind of place, you know. And you mentioned you had animals to feed. What kind of animals do you have there? Oh, we have two dogs, uh, nothing major, Aww. you know. Aww. My sister, uh, who lives next door, has chickens. And that's about uh. as rural as we get. How do the dog, what do the dogs think about the chickens? Um, our dog uh, killed one of the chickens once. Oh, no. Yes. I'm sorry I brought that up. That was, that, that, that was, uh, I wasn't here for that. I was in the hospital at the time. That was last year. Oh. Um, oh. Yeah, I had a brain hemorrhage about a year ago. Oh, no. Un unexplained. It was kind of scary. Um, oh. But, uh, but yeah, the, in the confusion, my wife was leaving the house and the dog got out and the chickens happened to be out and, and, uh, the dog got the chicken. Now oh, it's a dead chicken. So yeah, that'll happen. Yeah. So now we have the dogs on lockdown and, and there's a schedule for when the chickens go out. So <laughs> we have this plot of land that's been like a family plot of land since the early sixties, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm surrounded by family and we live like on this small area by, um, by a pond, a freshwater pond. Oh, so wow. It's pretty sweet. That, it's a sweet, that sounds, uh, sweet deal. Sounds idyllic. Um, it is, it is. If you, you gotta like your family though. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess that's true. Um, how was it spending COVID there? That must've been kind of nice to just Everyone's hunkered down anyway. I hate to say it, but COVID did not really change uh, my wife and I's um, schedule too much. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, obviously the live show thing uh, really sucked uh, and does mm -hmm. suck. It's coming back, though, it seems. Yeah. But also, um, we're more of a takeout kind of stay at home kind of uh, mm -hmm. folks. So COVID didn't really change us too much it wasn't that bad and then i had to work i was i was a um considered an essential worker so i've been working through the whole thing oh wow so uh so yeah we really didn't you know <laughs> just another day in paradise as they say you know there are still some of us that work and tour and stuff and you know those guys must really have been hurting um i couldn't imagine if i was in the middle of it and somebody ugh. put the brakes on it, like, uh, uh, horrible. Um, so you were, you did not have any uh, music projects. No, I just traveling. Kind of, I finished one up. My last project was called Oceans of the Moon, um, mm -hmm. and uh, we recorded a record for uh, Castle Face, John Dwyer's label. Oh yeah, nice. And that came out like a year or two ago, maybe, maybe three years ago. Years, years kind of blur together. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, we played a few shows for that and, you know, did the, did the thing. We didn't do a full tour cause you know, we're all older and have jobs and some of the members have yeah. kids and, um, we were just kind of taking a break from that. So it really didn't affect that at all either. Yeah. So, so speaking of, of castle face and all that, I mean, how did they, if John just kept going the whole time, I don't think he knows the meaning of the word stop. So, you know, he did keep going and he, you know, he obviously he felt, he felt it, uh, you know, it's a lot different 
of course, uh, being home and planning things. And, but, you know, he, he keeps busy recording. I mean, that guy is just, I joke around with him and, you know, call him an overachiever and tell him to slow the fuck down because he's making <laughs> the rest of us look really bad. But yeah, that, I mean, it's great though, that he's figuring stuff out and uh, able to, you know, able to maintain uh, his mm -hmm. income because, you know, he, to keep an organization like that going, you know, you need money flowing in. So, uh, yep. you know, that could have gone really bad. Well, I'm sure it's gone worse for some people, you know, Yeah. but, uh, he's a, that, like I said, that guy's a, that guy is a solid dude and a workaholic. So, yeah, I saw a couple of live things, um, something at a club and then, um, like at the beginning of COVID and then later the levitations, right stuff that was released on album too, yeah they put, so. it on, they put it on a record he did two solo uh well not solo things but he did two like kind of these almost jazz fusion records that are awesome with the with the keyboard keyboardist yes from oc's right yeah, yeah awesome i'm looking at the oceans of the moon artwork right now who did that artwork it's amazing the cover was done by an artist um named matt brinkman he was a uh, student at RISD in Providence around the time that we were all kind of playing shows and doing all that kind of thing. Um, he's one of my favorite artists that came out of the Fort Thunder uh, thing. Right. Um, I've always been a fan of his. I have a bunch of his, a uh, bunch of silkscreen show posters and things like that from him. Um, and I really wanted him to do the record cover. He was able to do it and it's, it blew my mind. He went above and beyond, you know. <laughs> and uh, when we did the record, we did a limited color um, vinyl release. And in that mm -hmm. one, the album cover is just the artwork with no text on it. So you can fold it out and it has the full uh, Matt Brinkman spread. Um, I kind of did that one for the head so you could have a piece of art. You know, if, yeah. even if you don't like the record and you like Matt Brinkman, you could put the thing in a frame, <laughs> have a Matt Brinkman work in your house, which is pretty awesome, I think. <laughs> wow, it is. I can't stop looking at it. Yeah, he did a great, great job on it. Um, and then I was going to talk to you about I the whole reason why I got in touch. Um, you've been, um, did you start the Instagram account where you're showing kind of like the um, poster art and silk screens and stuff like that? Yes, I did. Um, friend, an old friend, uh, this photographer, Mike Galinsky, uh, was mm -hmm. posting a lot of photographs from the early nineties. He was in a band called Sleepyhead and, um, mm -hmm. he's a filmmaker now. And, uh, and he was just posting a lot of old photos and, and, you know, we played a lot with Sleepyhead, uh, back in the very early nineties. So, there were a lot of six finger satellite photos. So it kind of jogged my memory and made me think back on a lot of that stuff. And um, I just remembered all of this, all of these photographs and posters and various things from that time that I've just squirreled away. And I thought, well, damn, this Instagram is a perfect um, yeah format to just unload this stuff you know even if one person looks at it and goes wow that's cool you know then it's worth it yeah. it's worth putting it up and there's a lot of stuff that i that i think is kind of you know not really out there uh, as far as some of those posters go um and then i'm going to be posting a lot of photographs to um you know mm -hmm. outtakes from photo sessions and then just snapshots oh i can't wait um but yeah the you know i don't know i i might have said this in an email but um you know, I kind of try to look forward in a lot of the stuff that I do. I try not to look back. I'm not yeah. sure why I, 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 but I really had hangups with looking back. Um, and recently I've been doing, I've been, uh, going to therapy, which is mm. a very good thing. Uh, awesome. It's been really helpful and I wasn't going to mention it, but I am going to mention it. Uh, yeah. And it's been helping me and it really put me in a frame of mind to kind of accept the past and um, and just kind of embrace it more. Uh, so mm -hmm. so the so the Instagram page has been a little bit of an outlet for that. Um, you know, 
Yeah. So before you, before you kind of, uh, were just moving along and not wanting to look back. Pretty much. That right? Yeah. 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 Just constantly moving forward. Um, you know, it would always be like the next project. What's the next project? What's the next project? And I mean, it's not like I was a workaholic. Like I did some, like, if I was lucky, I'd get something out every five <laughs> to 10 years, you know, right. but I never really wanted to, even when we did some satellite stuff, um, in the two thousands, like I didn't really want to go back and try to make it sound like old stuff or, you know, um, try to re right. recapture a certain sound or anything like that you know mm. it was all about just moving forward which i think you kind of have to do in, in in to an extent um but i just had a lot of hang-ups with the past i'm not sure why but it sounds really healthy that you want to move forward it seems like that's what human beings should do <laughs> you know mm, i guess <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but you know, I guess everything in moderation, but I, but I, I'd like to say about the Instagram page, a lot of people, there's kind of a community around that now. And I feel like people are connecting with it and I think it's a good thing. Yeah. It's pretty neat you know. seeing the, you know, yeah. seeing the, uh, the responses and seeing the, the, you know, the, uh, seeing the, the, the separate stories that people have, especially of show, like remembering shows and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really neat, you know, um, and it is a connecting thing. That's something that uh, mm -hmm. I kind of lost track of in the last four years and uh, the, well, let's just say, unpleasantness um, of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But you want to remind yourself there's other people like me. Well, that's right? that's the yeah. thing, you know, it's great to kind of connect on that level and and being of, you know, I'm you know, I'm rounding up on 50. So, mm -hmm. you know, being of that age of not really being too social, uh, in, in real life, um, you know, to, to have a collection of people that kind of dig this stuff is, is kind of refreshing. Oh yeah. I think it's great. I think, and it, it does show you, um, people do, you, you are important to people, you know, like you're part of their, almost their, not childhood, but you know, their formative years in a way. Like for me, I went to, um, well, okay. So the first time I heard of you guys was because of the live at the ACI thing. <laughs> it was like this legendary thing. And, um, and for the listeners, uh, I will, maybe I'll ask you the real story behind it because I heard that the liner notes were um, just kind of a funny joke, um, <laughs> but we thought it was real. And so we were like, this is the most hilarious thing. These guys are the coolest. And then I heard I, my, my introduction was severe exposure and I, it blew my mind. I was just like, what is this dark wonderfulness? And um, started seeing you guys, you, I think I saw you twice at Emo's and then Jay was yelling at the crowd. We were the worst audience. <laughs> The, the nightmare crowd that's so stoned, not, not moving, just staring, you know, yeah. standing perfectly still. He hated us. He was like, do you guys want your $2 back? Because <laughs> literally, yeah. the, it was $2 on weekdays at Emo's. Oh, then. that's great. I mean, we always we always had a great time at Emo's. I mean, that was, <laughs> that was part of the show. But... We loved it. We were like, this is the best. That was a good time. Um, Texas was great. Uh, we always had great. Mm -hmm. Uh, shows in Texas, Chicago, uh, you know, LA, New York, Minneapolis, mm -hmm. you know, we had some strongholds <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the crowd in Texas was always pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. I feel like, uh, I feel like uh, there was that one show I was at where Jay, I don't know if it was an act or anything, but it, we were really not a good crowd. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people were internally stoked about what was happening, but like, come on, you got to right, right. show something. <laughs> yeah, it would get frustrating, I think, if, you know, after four weeks on the road when you'd get to a place and, you know, you'd be giving everything you got and and then yeah. you're just getting crossed arms <laughs> and quizzical looks yes. back, you know. So, College town nerds. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, as a band, we were pretty <laughs> confrontational anyway, so, um you know, even if you, even if the crowd wasn't like that, I'm sure Jay would have found something else to heckle you guys for. So. Oh, that was <laughs> awesome. That was my favorite. I loved it. Um, going back to the ACI thing. So whose fault was that like a sub pop marketing thing? 
no or? no we came up uh -huh. with that um we used to okay. come up with a lot of kind of um fully baked ideas um you know mm -hmm. without getting too in depth about the meaning of fully baked um but <laughs> you know we would come up with these just these ideas that weren't music and uh most of it revolved around you know the design of albums and the presentation of the releasing of seven inches some of them involved things that had nothing to do with that but we won't talk about those um okay. but you know that was just an idea that we had come up with because we had been listening to some old you know records we were all record collectors so um you know we listened to i believe there's a james brown record like a i don't think it's live at the apollo it's it's one of those live james brown records where you know the the live sound it's obviously recorded in a studio and the live sound was like canned uh or sometimes recorded by oh. extras uh you know in the studio and then just looped you know so if you have a close if you have a good ear you kind of pick up on that stuff and and then there was like maybe a joe tex record that had the same kind of thing um so we came up with this concept to rather than just release a seven inch of two songs we said well let's do it as a fake live seven inch oh, so we recorded God. it as a fake live song um we recorded all the crowd sounds um you know oh all of the God. interaction between jay and the crowd is kind of jay just kind of improving off of the looped uh i don't it wasn't even looped i don't think i think we actually we didn't really get into loops that much so we would actually say like okay the song is going to be about five minutes long so we just recorded like five minutes of crowd sounds mm -hmm. um Wow, where'd you get the crowd sounds at a live show? No, we recorded them in our studio. Oh, I see. We got oh four. God. We would get four of us out into the room and just start hooping and hollering like a crowd. What? And then we would go back and then double track it. So then there'd be eight of us, and then we just, oh. you know, we would just multi track it. So there, so four of us would turn into like you know thirty of us or something. Whoa. Um, it sounds real. <laughs> yeah, kind of, I guess. I can't Well help now up. I'm gonna go back and listen, but <laughs> ah, that is hilarious. Yeah. So we would do stuff like where we would bring up the um you know, we'd bring up the volume. You can hear like the volume increase like after certain prods by Jay, like Jay would say something and then we'd bring up the crowd noise, you know. <laughs> It was like tricks like that. So then, of course, the the whole concept of it being recorded at the uh, Adult Correctional Institute of Rhode Island, which is like the maximum security prison in, outside of Providence, that kind of came out. So we had to do the photo shoot outside of the ACI, which was, you know, the photographer who uh, who did that shoot posted like, oh yeah, back in the days where you know, you could just walk up on the grounds of a maximum security oh, prison wow. and have a photo shoot with no permission, you know? You guys were close, too. <laughs> it, it appears that we're close. We weren't that close. Okay, uh, okay. And then there was some, there was a, there was some uh, photography uh, hoodoo uh, with the uh, guard tower. I think the guard tower okay. was kind of superimposed. Oh, wow. Oh my God, this is even better than it being real. <laughs> yeah, and then we came up with the letter uh, to go along with it, you know. Uh, it looked so official. Well, that, so that's you guys like Photoshop that or what? No, that was pre Photoshop. That was, yeah, that was all. Uh, I think Jeff Kleinsmith is the art director, yeah. I believe, of Sub Pop. Yep. So yep. he took care of a lot of that stuff, you know.
So what did he say when you guys presented him with this concept? Was he delighted or? Everyone was or psyched about it. I don't remember oh. getting any sort of backlash, really. That's awesome. Um, oh my God. Well, he did a great job on that letter. It looks pretty official. Yeah, I I think Jay Ryan might have wrote it. Um, I, you know, I don't really remember who, who actually, you know, drew it up, but my guess is Jeff Kleinsmith. What was it like working with Jeff? Did you ever get to work with him on some visuals or? Well, we had a give or take. Like, um, we all, we usually came up with all the concept stuff for our record covers, uh, and seven inch covers. Um, mm -hmm. and we would throw a lot of the concept stuff or sketches to him. And obviously he would sort it out, uh, for the finished product, you know, um, mm -hmm. I remember when severe exposure happened, he threw a few ideas out our way and, you know, some of them were like, eh, and then one of them mm -hmm. we were like, okay, you know, um, so, you know, there was like a give or take there for sure. Uh, but we always had such strong ideas that it was, you know, there wasn't too much room to stray too far from, from it. You know? that, that's great. He did you a great service. Um, and I can tell it's definitely, uh, it came from you guys, the the silver foil, which was like so amazing. Yeah, about that record and the, the the full length poster. This yeah, the severe exposure stuff. Um, that was heavily influenced by. I mean, most of our <laughs> most of our album art was heavily influenced by the art from the uh, San Francisco band Chrome. Um, oh, I love Chrome. Yeah. yeah. So you know, we were huge Chrome fans. I'm still a huge Chrome fan. Uh, Me too. But, um, but, you know, we really loved those record covers. Uh, and mm. for Severe Exposure, that was our attempt at the Red Exposure uh, um, album cover, which is kind of oh. a picture of those two in this weird sort of, you know, uh, shimmery, psychedelic kind of thing, you know? So we, we kind of were going for that, like a very odd kind of, you know, robotic kind of thing. Um, I yes. think I okay. I came up with the idea of shooting the photo in reverse because like the, we were bandying about the idea of doing like using a uh, photo negative of us. Um, mm -hmm. But I wanted to try something where we painted it like we reversed all the colors in real life and then shot it as and then and then um, developed it uh, in reverse, you know. So mm -hmm. for the photo shoot, we painted all our skin uh, jet black with clown mm -hmm. paint. Um, and we wore, you know, white clothes instead of black clothes, you know, a um, black shirt, uh, white tie. I love that. That's on the other seven inch, the cocaine. Well, that's, that's, yes, that's like the original, that's from one of the original um, uh, sessions, the photo sessions for that. Wow. Uh, that was Charles Peterson shot that stuff. Um, so, so we, we tried it and it worked great. The results were awesome. I, you know, Hell yeah. I was really happy with the results of that. So, and I think like for that album cover, I think Jeff Kleinsmith added like the lines coming down. Yeah. Um, so that was like his design uh, mm -hmm. input on that. Um, yeah. That was the kind of stuff that we did. We just came up with these weird ideas and said, Hey, let's see if this will happen. This will work, you know? First album, The Pigeon, um, Most Popular Bird, um, all, and The Machine Cuisine EP, were those look, and correct me if I'm wrong, they look kind of influenced by Kruger, Barbara Kruger? Oh, that, I, or... I don't even know Barbara Kruger. Okay. <laughs> but I'll look her up after this. If you look it up, you'll be like, oh, okay, kind of, maybe. Right, but, right. Yeah. Oh, cool. It, kind of also like weirdo sci-fi yeah well that was the thing on the on the pigeon record we were getting into um you know kind of sci-fi not really sci-fi like cyberpunk stuff you know we all were really big fans of philip dick um mm -hmm. you know um jeter william gibson you know so we were kind of yeah. into that that kind of paranoid sci-fi vibe we wanted the records to kind of reflect that so when we had the chance to do the Pigeon is the Most Popular Bird record, we really tried to run with it. Um, you know, that record, that record was released as a cassette, a CD, 
and two vinyl EPs that kind of mm-hmm. made up the LP. Um, okay. So we had a we had like this big plan for the artwork. Like the I believe the cassette has a different cover. The CD has an image of one kind of movie monster. First EP has one image. The second EP has two images. The CD has three images. Uh, and I, I'm not sure what we did with the cassette. But, um, you know, there were all these really intricate, like, kind of things to tie everything in, you know. We had, like, photos on the back that had our friend, uh, the author Sam Lipsight, was a good friend of ours. And he mm-hmm. sat in for the back photos of those uh, those records. You know, and then we had, like, in the photo of the photo, we had we had pictures of each band member on a on the wall of the room that we were in. I mean, like oh. we were we were going so down, <laughs> so deep down our own rabbit hole. It was ridiculous. <laughs> um, but I think it yielded good results. You know, I mean, the whole lot, the the whole the whole obviously the whole uh, objective is to you know make your record stand out in a in a in a record bin. You know, and that's what we right. tried to do. You know, the whole band was very uh, visually um inclined um you know so we all kind of had a hand in in the design of a lot of that stuff i mean i kind of took the lead on a bunch of the stuff like i remember sourcing the photos for the pigeon is the most popular bird record and Mm -hmm. it was great this is all before the this store in manhattan that just sold uh promotional eight by tens from movies and tv uh, I wow. can't remember what it was called, but it was just, it was like a comic book store, but just with photos. And I remember spending an afternoon in there going through the photos and, um, and that's where I got all the photos for the, uh, the pigeon record. Uh, there's uh, all the monsters, and all everything? the monsters. Yeah. We got, we wow. got from that place and that all, all that stuff stemmed from when I was a little kid, I got this book on science fiction monsters it's like you know like the the book club of you know the week or whatever i paid my 40 cents and got this stupid little you know 40 page book that had all these black and white photos of um old 50s and 60s uh movie monsters so that's where the influence from that came from i was able to actually find two of the photos from that book so i was really excited Oh, nice. Um, do you, you don't still have that book? I do still have that book, actually. Oh. <laughs> I do. You're good at keeping things. I, great. yeah, yeah. That's somewhat, somewhat defining <laughs> hoarding, but. I'm sure your wife has something to say. <laughs> yeah, well, she has her, she has her uh, things that she keeps too, so. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so you each have your thing. Yes. Um. Oh my gosh. I love, those pictures are so perfect for the vibe of your music too. Like you guys were all clearly art school people um, actually none of us were art school people God, you're so <laughs> funny because i always assumed that yeah like you were all RISD, or maybe like you started going to RISD and then decided to do music instead or you know well i didn't really make it to RISD. i i was supposed, supposed to go to art school out of high school um i had gotten uh i was accepted to parsons in new york and uh, nice. the art institute of boston um, mm-hmm. but I couldn't swing the finances and then wound up in a band. And that was the end of my uh, visual arts career, basically. So, you know, so, so I kind of had a little, I mean, very little for a, 18, a 19 or 20 year old, uh, had a very mm-hmm. little background in it. Um, but yeah. the other guys, uh, went to Providence college, which is kind of, uh, sort of a religious type school um, and uh, one of the dudes went to Brown um, mm-hmm. our bass player was really artistic uh, but he was before like he, he was in the on the first EP um, okay, none of us, been... yeah like I like when I said earlier I'm not really qualified to be speaking of any of this other than the fact that I lived it <laughs> because yeah. I don't you know I have no degree I really I you no, know. that doesn't. That's not a qualifier in my book. I I work in academia, and I double down on that statement. Yeah, well, wow, that's good. <laughs> I mean, it's not. Um, it's definitely not. Um, uh, you know, prerequisite for anything. If you love something, you know, 
If you love something and you have, like, look, you you found a great outlet for your artistic tendencies. A band is a great vehicle for that. You need flyers, you need posters, you need album covers. Yeah, it was it was great. And I mean, you know, a lot of times when I was on tour, I'd I'd be drawing in a book, you know, um, just just for the just for the fun of it, you know. So. Um, and then what about so another story about everything's about me, um, but. So when YouTube first came out, I was in college, speaking of college, and I was in our library and one of my classmates was like, hey, have you heard of this thing called YouTube? And I was like, no, what's that? Another thing, I don't care. And they were like, no, 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 you can look up any video, like any video that's ever been recorded, like what would you look up? And because I didn't have internet at home, you know, people just didn't have computers, you know, back then it was probably 1998. Eight, no, it was 2001 or something like that. Yeah, that's still early. Yeah, and so the first thing I typed in was Six Finger Satellite. And the Parlor <laughs> Games Parlor Games video came up, and I was like, what, this is the best? And then from then on, I was, like, addicted to YouTube, like, trying nice. to find videos oh, God, of yeah. every live show, every vid- weird video. Oh, I've spent countless hours on YouTube, that's for sure. There's still stuff appearing now, you know, stuff that uh, people post like, oh, let's check this out. And I'm like, holy shit, how have I not seen that? Being a musician, I'm def- I am definitely nerd out looking up bands and live shows and performances, oh. people, and you know, and I, I can kill hours. But eventually, you know, every once in a while, somebody will post something and I'll be like, how did I not? see you know Hawkwind in 1970 oh like, what yeah heck? exactly like <laughs> you know? time just goes by things slip through the cracks and then yeah um but yeah that video is so great it's so like creepy and um you know kind of lo-fi in a way that people try to recreate now sometimes <laughs> yeah like... yeah yeah there's an app there's an app for that I believe <laughs> <laughs> the creepy uh, filter um, just with that weird, like, I don't know what it was like a hospital device, like the thing with the waveform on it. And oh, yeah, that was a, an old oscilloscope. Uh, that's an elect- electronic um, testing device, basically. Um, but yeah, we had one of those. So we had music hooked up to it to make that waveform kind of, uh, you know, that whole that whole video was uh, Guy Benoit, a very good friend of ours, uh, mm-hmm. who's also a filmmaker. and. Um, he came up with the entire concept and execution of that and he did an amazing job i mean Mm -hmm. all the people and extras we shot that in one afternoon wow Um, well one day it it, it was a long day you know we Mm -hmm. started probably in the morning and shot all day uh but we shot that in our studio which was a place called parlor Uh, um and you know, he just, he had a small crew with him and we just invited a bunch of our friends and said, hey, we're shooting video, dress up and we're going to have a party. And that's kind of what we did. And I, I love the results. It, it it came out amazing. It looks great. Uh, and it has, you know, it just has a little bit of a, a bit of a sinister vibe to it. That's uh, a great was, word to describe a lot of things that you guys did. It's a little bit yeah. dark, a little bit like almost like horror but like sci-fi horror sinister yeah um, it was it was never pure evil <laughs> no playful like playful sinister yes yes tongue I in mean, cheek tongue in cheek yes yeah. we always yeah. tried to keep a good sense of humor but we also tried to keep uh in touch with the uh, you know the dark side of things because you know when you glaze over all the dark stuff um you know it, it just kind of gives them gives that stuff a place to flourish uh, oh, yeah which i think we're all kind of realizing right now oh uh, um, yeah for sure um there, there was definitely like it wasn't a negative feeling no i mean we we definitely you know uh, we definitely did some we did some we did some dicey things we pushed the envelope on taste and bad taste i think <laughs> um you know we had we kind of skirted some some lines with the uh, we use like kind of fascist imagery and some stuff yeah um you know we definitely kind of you know did a little did a little play acting and the stormtrooper kind of thing mm-hmm. you know which you know if it was done today we would probably a not do it and b if yeah. we didn't do it we would we would be called out immediately for it 
Yeah. Um, but a lot of that stuff, like, you know, was tongue in cheek and it was, I hate to say it, but in, in the context of the time, you know, it was just something that we did and we didn't really think of the ramifications. I mean, we, you know, we were young rock and roll dudes kind of living in this fantasy land and, and we were our own gang. So we were obviously an echo chamber for a lot of the ideas. Yeah. Um, and we didn't really think too much of, of, you know, if it, uh, if it would offend anyone. In fact, we probably did it to, to offend to people. To offend. Yeah. yeah. Because you, know? you want to get a reaction. Right. I mean, that was the thing. That was the whole reason behind kind of um, embracing that sort of bad vibe imagery uh, was mm -hmm. to get a reaction because, you know, you got to think too in the early to mid 90s, a lot of indie rock or post punk or whatever you want to call it, whatever genre it, yeah. it is. But in that time frame, you know, going to live shows could be a very, very boring pros prospect, you know. Um, yeah. You know, with shoegaze bands being uh, big, you know, you could go to those shows. And I mean, I used to see uh, people falling asleep at those shows, like literally on the floor. It could have had <laughs> something to do with heroin. I don't know. That was also hip at the time. But it was very hot in Texas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bad That's... ventilation, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah, but, you know, um, you know, so we were obviously pushing the boundaries. I mean, Obviously, with our sound, we were super loud, very aggressive. Yeah, you yeah. know, very in your face. There was no, there was no lulls in the music, no place no. to kind of talk in between. You know, when we played live, we tried to keep songs short so nobody would start, you know, just <laughs> talking like, you know, um, we just wanted to, you know, shake everybody and say, hey, there's more to, there's more to life than, you know, what we were seeing. You guys blew our minds honestly that that's awesome you know that <laughs> you and lightning bolt they, oh yeah, yeah they they were just a definitely a force of nature that band mm -hmm. um the two guys holy shit yeah and they played a bunch of frat parties in austin back then and just like <laughs> just that freaked everyone been, out it was awesome that must have been great yeah oh yeah yeah they're they were they're really good if you get them in a small room they can really tear <laughs> it up but definitely i could tell you you are not from around these parts <laughs> like Oh, there was yeah, definitely no. a Providence thing. Like it was so refreshing, uh, woke us up. You know, and, and that's the thing too, being from Providence, it's kind of like a bit of a Gothic, you know, dark New England town. HP Lovecraft uh, was from Providence. So there's a lot of kind of just bad vibe in Providence anyway. Uh -huh. um, and that weird mayor and all that drama. Oh God. Yeah. That guy. <laughs> I mean, that that just scratches the surface. The, the, if you, if you look deep in the, in the politics Mafia. of, Oh God. Yeah. It's all, yeah. it's all, there's, there's, there's some bad mojo in that, in that city for sure. You know, so we were kind of just sort of channeling that. Um, but getting back to, you know, the context and whatnot, you know, that's mm -hmm. just kind of, that was just what we, what we were going for, you know. It was the grab them by the throat kind of thing rather than, uh, you know, tiptoeing. <laughs> well, it definitely caught my attention. And uh, I'm also noticing there's, there's different themes throughout the visual, um, the way that you've presented yourself to selves visually. Um, like there's a theme of Jay screaming into a phone. <laughs> yes. And, I Cause it. I'm looking at the, the split seven inch with green magnet school. Yeah. That's and, great. And then the parlor games video, there's a connection there, but yeah. I had, I wanted to ask about, I'm hoping you will find some outtakes from this shot from this photo shoot. Um, what the hell was the story? Because I know you posted this on Instagram and you said 
that this was a cannabis fueled idea. <laughs> oh, the what the, uh, the split the, seven inch. Yeah, with green uh, magnet school. Right. Well, that was definitely that was like really early on. I mean, we were all living. The band rented a three family uh, apartment. Um, three of the members were on the first floor and two of the members were on the third floor along with a very good friend of ours who played bass with us on a later record. Um, but so, you know, we were back and forth with a lot of stuff. It was very, it was a very um, fertile time for ideas and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we used to do a lot was um, smoke cannabis mm -hmm. and, um, and we would listen to records and watch television with the sound off. Uh, that was a big thing and you know in between records or during records we would come up with these grand schemes uh of surreality basically um and some of the schemes would actually happen and this was one of them we had a great idea to do a split seven inch with green magnet school and the concept was that we would be in these kind of devo-esque futuristic suits mm -hmm. And we'd be posing in a colonial background. And then the Green Magnet School would be dressed in colonial suits oh. in a futuristic background. And it would be like this communication through the ages kind of thing, time warp. I, I, I think Jay came up with the concept of the declaration of techno-colonialism first, maybe. That's, yeah, when you fold it out, yeah. Yeah, so we may have been like trying to bring the images around to that. I can't remember which came first, but um, but yeah, I mean, we you know we came up with all these crazy ideas for that for that shoot, and <laughs> and then we presented it, and they were and Sub Pop was like, okay, and um, and you know we even presented it to Green Magnet School, and they were like, okay, so it was awesome. You know, everybody mm -hmm. was behind it, and. And then we had uh, the photographer that shot the uh, pictures for that was James Apt, who further down the road eventually became our bass player. Oh, wow. Um, which was a cool little connection there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that whole thing was a trip, you know. Uh, we showed up and James uh, was the designer also. So he, uh, he came up with those suits and the little insignias and the belt and whatnot and he had I all the props it. you know uh -huh. um, and um and then they went uh they went the green magnet school went to like a costume shop and they all rented those uh, <laughs> those kind of wig yeah the little triangle hats and yes pirate yes. shirts the sign yes, pirate shirts. Yes. Um. I, I kind of felt bad for him after i saw that photo but they were good sports <laughs> Um, so the inside of it, were you going by a different name? I'm not seeing your signature on this declaration of techno independence. Oh, um, I don't know. I I might have signed it Rich Rich Drago. Yeah, yeah, it, it is Rich Rich Drago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a nickname for some reason. They the band started calling me that for a brief time, and it stuck. I, th I believe Rich Drago was a baseball player. I'm not sure. Oh, that's funny. I love this um, declaration. It's be it's. It's made vanity and pomp of prodigal expense. I mean, this the wording. It's so funny. Jay, Jay came up with a lot of the uh, the text for a lot of the, the, the stuff on the records, you know. So he's he's definitely the wordsmith or the or the word mangler. Word, you want to call it, word wrangler. Maybe. Word wrangler. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to ask, I ask every guest, um, what is the first album cover you remember? Um, did you have a chance to think back on that? Yes. Um, and this is going to sound extremely pedestrian, but it was uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club. Band. That's mine too. That's really? Mine. Yeah, my mom had that. It was a gatefold, and I was so fascinated with that. Yeah, my I was lucky enough to have older brothers and sisters, and they had left some records in the house that I grew up in. So, you know, I was exposed to a lot of records like um, uh, 
Lonely Hearts Club Band, the Magical Mystery Tour, and the White Album were in my house. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first Led Zeppelin. I was going to say the first Led Zeppelin record, but that one, that one was kind of always there, but it was kind of mysterious to me as a kid. As a mm-hmm. kid, I, I went obviously right to the um, that Beatles record cover because yep. it's so colorful and just it contains so many little uh, Easter eggs, you know? Yes. Um, it was like great. made for kids almost. It, really? Like, it was. Yeah. yeah. And the Magical Mystery Tour uh, cover is similar, you know? with the bright colors and everything yeah kids love psychedelia yeah they do you know it's i still like it i'm almost 50 i've never not liked it i don't know no me neither (laughs) i think we cover is there anything else you want to uh go over anything to promote i am the the six finger satellite obviously on instagram yes uh check out the six finger satellite instagram page for Mm -hmm. posts of you know, posters, uh, photos, and whatnot. Um, uh, Six Finger Satellite is releasing some records this year. We have uh, a new record of uh, demo recordings from the Law of Ruins record, um, a oh, bunch nice. of un- unheard stuff. And then we're releasing something that um, compiles the Weapon EP with the very first EP that Six Finger Satellite uh, recorded, which was a demo tape. Um, and it's going to also include the uh, two tracks from the techno colonialism seven inch. Yeah, that's going to be a good uh, a good release. So that's going to be coming up hopefully twenty twenty one. We're getting really close. So. And what's the art? Do you guys have it nailed down? Um, the art for the Law of Ruins uh-huh. thing is being handled by Jay and the guy who runs Limited Appeal Records, who is, uh, and I believe. I'm not sure if Nick Blakey might have a hand in the artwork of that too. I'm not sure. But then the artwork for the weapon probe uh, techno-colonialism thing, we haven't sorted that out yet. Okay. Fair Um, enough. Well, that's a lot to look forward to. Jeez. Yeah. It's, It's great to still have stuff kind of, you know, moving, getting out there. Exactly. What about the, um, the other music project, what was it? I'm so sorry, on Castle Face, Oceans of the Moon. Oh, Oceans of the Moon. Um, that's that's kind of on break right now. Okay. Um, we're kind. Of, I'm kind of focusing on the satellite stuff. There, there's a there's a possibility we're trying to get some new satellite stuff together, but it's in the Ooh. very, it's in the planning phase. Okay. Um, but um, but we're kind of we're exploring all options right now. Let's just say. Wow. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's great news. And um, again, thank you so much for what a treat. Thanks for having me. Like I said, I'm flattered that anybody would even want to listen to me spout this shit. Oh my God. Are you kidding? (laughs) So I have to say, um, when you posted that thing today, the the show box with shellac. Oh yeah. And I have to tell you, that freaked me out when I saw that because my ex, he used to live in Providence, um, Uh who I lived with. He had that framed and hanging up in our house. So I looked at that every day, the baseball shellac thing. So it was like a total weird um i don't know uh coincidental moment when i saw that today i was like holy shit so i texted him and i go look what he posted today (laughs) (laughs) uh he said he missed seeing joe because we were talking about joe preston he missed seeing joe play with men's recovery because of the van dying coming to seattle and again when the tour van completely died before getting to providence they were going to play (laughs) fort thunder (laughs) Yeah, those guys had some pretty, uh, pretty bad luck. <laughs> uh, anyways, that was just funny, um, funny coincidence. Yeah, it's fun. Isn't isn't it weird how like little connections like that can kind of take you to take you to a different place or bring you back to a another oh time? God, you know, I, music I, music is like that big time for me. You know, like you can listen to it and almost be transported back. Exactly. You know, almost smell the smells, taste the tastes everything it's like you're it's, there absolutely yeah it's yeah. a magical thing it it's, is it's, it's a great thing you know and six finger satellite you guys were sorcerers for sure we tried i i, I just wanted people to know that we were hard at work on that stuff we we spent a lot of time on that shit you know i'm glad that i'm glad that people dig it it makes me really happy still so appreciated i still i mean i have i made a playlist when the covid 
started. I swear to God, surveillance house is on it and uh, <laughs> uh, Simeon fever. I nice. mean, it just, it went really well with the <laughs> pandemic. You're always with me. All that hard That's work great. is just really super appreciated. And That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, anyways, I'll let you go. <laughs> All right. Well, my dogs just came out, so they're probably going to start barking. So. All right. Well, thanks, Rick. Have a good day. All right. Thanks, Clarita. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I'm running. Grab it for